Good evening. Thankful for the presence of everyone tonight. Just want to make you aware that Neil is preaching in Nebraska this week, and so be praying for the gospel in that area. Be praying for his warmth. I think he said something like it's going to get down to the 20s tonight, and so I'm just glad to be in Kentucky. But be praying for the gospel meeting and the preaching that I know he's doing that's blessing the church there and for the work going on throughout the week there. You know, people have said about the book of Ecclesiastes that if there was a competition for the most pessimistic book in all the Bible, Ecclesiastes potentially could win. Philippians would come in last for all that it has to say about rejoicing. Some individuals have said it's probably the most modern and applicable critique of secular humanism there is in the world. It deals with so much of how we live. It deals with food and drink and relationships and the sexual relationship and work and all the things that we find ourselves going through on a daily basis. It's a practical book that gets right to the heart of what human living is ultimately all about. The book gets his name, Ecclesiastes, from the Greek translation of this book. The Hebrew translation or title is Koheleth, and it's the first couple of verses in there where it talks about the person who's writing this book. English translations bring the word over by simply calling the person writing this book the preacher, and that's Solomon. He was the king in Jerusalem, in Israel, and he was David's son. And the book of Ecclesiastes is written from this vantage point of what life is like under the sun. And unbelievers have picked up the book of Ecclesiastes and walked away pretty angry, saying, See, even a godly life yields nothing. This man tried to live for God, do the best that he could. Life didn't go the way that he wanted him to. Sometimes Christians, believers, pick up the book of Ecclesiastes, read through it, and sort of walk away confused and frustrated. It can be a difficult book to get your hands around. But one of the things to appreciate about the book of Ecclesiastes is it is talking about two ideas. What is life like under the sun as a human being apart from God's involvement? And when he finds that over and over again, Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 2, and at several points throughout the book, Solomon says, that's a life of vanity. Vanities of vanities. It's a chasing after the wind. It yields nothing. But life under the sun, viewed through the lens of God's involvement, though difficult, hard, and occasionally disappointing, is a life worth living indeed. I know it's in the Old Testament, and Romans 15 and verse 4 says the things written before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. But what Solomon teaches us in the book of Ecclesiastes provides lessons for how we ought to live our lives today. It's a part of that section of scripture that we know as wisdom literature. And I know right now on Wednesday night, many of you are in a great class where Brother Charles Plemons is walking through the book of Proverbs. And just appreciate Proverbs and the Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes. All of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament is designed to take the law of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy, and say, let's put work clothes on the law of Moses. What would it look like to live out God's law on a daily basis? You can read the law and it'll tell you what God wants from you. But how do you do it in various situations? What does it mean? to be God's person on a day-to-day basis. Insert biblical wisdom literature that says, here's how to live a wise and God-honoring life. And the book of Ecclesiastes teaches us to do just that. Tonight, and if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn it to chapter 1. We're going to notice Solomon gives us some eternal principles that are true for all time, everywhere, for all people, right here in the book of Ecclesiastes. How can we live life under the sun to the good and glory of God? Six principles of eternal significance from the book of Ecclesiastes, and then we'll extend heaven's invitation. Here's number one. The first thing Solomon says that we need to do if we're going to enjoy life under the sun is realize there's nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.9 may be the most famous verse in all of the book. It says, the things that have been are that which shall be, that which has been done is that which will be done. There's no new thing under the sun. Verse 10, is there anything wherever it may be said, see this is new? No, it has been already of old time. The first thing Solomon says that we need to appreciate if we're going to enjoy life under the sun and appreciate the lives God has given us is there is nothing new under the sun. If you fast forward to chapter 3 and verse 15, he's going to double down, double down on this idea that there's nothing new that's taking place under the sun. Life sort of happens in cycles and repeats itself. There are just certain things you can expect to take place, and it's important that we appreciate that that's the case. In the 90s, there was a show that used to come on called Early Edition. This man would receive a newspaper, the Chicago Sun-Times, a day early every day. And when he would receive this newspaper in this show, there would always be a dilemma. Somebody's going to die in an accident. Something terrible is going to happen to them. And he receiving this newspaper a day early was responsible for trying to go out and prevent that catastrophe from taking place. He knew some things that were going to happen. And with that prior knowledge, it was almost prophetic. 
he was supposed to go out and try to change the world. That's not what Solomon's arguing for in Ecclesiastes chapter 1. He's not saying, hey, everybody has always had iPhones or Adam drove a Honda, but he is saying this. He's saying that there are just some cycles. There are some things that you can bank on always taking place. It's Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22 where God says, as long as the earth stands, the seasons will. Spring and summer, fall and winter, sowing and harvest. He says you can bank on those things taking place. And if we want to enjoy our lives to the glory of God, we need to appreciate that there is nothing new under the sun. This keeps us from hyper pessimism and hyper optimism. We realize that life happens in cycles. There are some things that you can bank on happening. Theologians sometimes talk about common grace, just meaning in every human heart there's a knowledge of who God is. And what that means is no sinner, no non-Christian is as bad as he or she could be, and no Christian is ever as good as he or she could be. You just should expect that to be the case because, after all, there's nothing new under the sun. This principle will keep us from being overly hard on ourselves, thinking to ourselves, my life's harder than everybody else's. I'm the de devil's favorite target and punching bag. Nobody has it any more harder than me. My marriage and the difficulties we're facing, it's only us. The temptations I'm struggling with, nobody's ever seen anything like this. The Bible says that's not true. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, Paul says, There is no temptation that's taken you, but that which is common to man. But God is faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation, he'll make a door of escape. Or 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour, whom you resist steadfast in your faith, knowing the same things being accomplished by your brethren throughout the world. It's not just you and it's not just me. It's ever been for other people and other times, because after all, there's nothing new under the sun. You read the book of Ecclesiastes and Solomon goes through various experiments and some of this frustrates him and then he comes to this conclusion. This is just how life is as we're here. I remember as a kid, I'd be riding in the car with my mom and a song would come on, a song that I liked and I would try to convince her that it was the best song in the world. She really didn't think much of my musical taste and I don't know if that's changed much, but here's what would often happen. She would say, Hiram, that's not a new song. I'd say, oh, yes, this song just came out. It is a new song. She'd say, no, that's not a new song. They sampled that song from something else. These things just kind of happen in cycles. And over time, I'd find out, you know what? It's really not a new song. Somebody did make a song like this one before. It's really nothing new. And we look around at our world, at the sin, at the wickedness, at the evil, and we might think, you know, humanity is doing different stuff, no different flavors. But there's nothing new under the sun. There are some things you and I can always bank on being true. And here's a short list. Number one. We will reap what we sow. That's always going to be true. Galatians 6, 7 through 9. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you'll reap everlasting life. You'll reap what you sow. Number two, there will be sin in this world. Luke 17 and verse 1, Jesus says, Woe to the world because of offenses. But in this world, because of Adam and Eve, offenses must come. Luke 17 and verse 1, there's nothing new under the sun. Christians will face persecution. Matthew 5 and verse 12, 2 Peter 3 and verse 12. Don't say when people start to persecute you because you follow Jesus Christ, I don't know why this is happening. It's always happened. It always will happen. There's nothing new under the sun. God is good. Exodus 34 and verse 6, Nahum 1 and verse 7. He's always been good. He always will be good. In fact, he doesn't know how to do anything else but be good. That's always going to be true because there's nothing new under the sun. God's way to live will always be the best way to live. Proverbs 9 and verse 6, forsake the foolish way and live. Go in the way that leads to understanding. That's always going to be the best way to live your life in view of what God says. Everybody in this room, if Jesus delays his coming, will die and face judgment. Hebrews 9 and verse 27. That's always been true. There's nothing new under the sun. There will always be people who don't believe in God and who try to convince other people to give up their belief in God and go in their same direction. Psalm 14 and verse 1. That's always been true. It might be heightened in certain eras, but that's always been true and it's true now. The devil is a liar and a deceiver. John 8 and verse 44. And God is a rescuer, a forgiver, and a redeemer. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. There are some things... That had just always been the case. And Solomon says, if you're going to live wisely under the sun, you've got to appreciate there's really nothing new here. Here's number two. Enjoy your life. 
Sometimes Christians say, well, you know, God doesn't want you to enjoy your life, and a lot of people are in sin because they're so concerned with fun. They're just concerned with living for now, with pleasing themselves, and as a result, they've thrown themselves into sin. God doesn't care if you're happy. God wants you holy. In fact, God wants your obedience. He doesn't care if you do it with a smile on your face or not. Just do whatever God says. That's all God wants. And then on the other side of this, there are some people that say, no, God put us here for joy and for our enjoyment alone. And if I find myself doing something in service to God and I'm not enjoying it, I should stop. Or when my life is no longer pleasurable or bringing me joy, then that means God has failed me. Both of those ideas are false. Life is not all about human joy. It is about holiness. And sometimes that requires us to do things that don't bring us immediate satisfaction. And at the very same time, God does want us to enjoy our lives. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and notice what Solomon says in verse 24. Because sometimes people hate their lives. In fact, that was Solomon. If you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and go up to verse 17, after he surveyed life from all these various angles, he says, for this reason, I hated my life. And that happens to some people. That's never God's design. Solomon's trying all of these things to find happiness, fulfillment, and pleasure. And at one point, Ecclesiastes 2.17, he says, I hated my life and my labor under the sun. But he is going to tell us and find out that's never been God's design for your life. In chapter 2 and verse 24, he says, man has no other purpose or no, no other pleasure than to enjoy his labor, his work that God has given him. And then he says, this I've seen, this is from the hand of God. No, man has no greater purpose in life than to enjoy his work, his food, his labor. And he says, I found out that this actually comes from the hand of God, but there's more. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and notice verses 12 and 13. If you write in your Bible, these will be verses to underline and mark. Remember, Solomon's going on this survey under the sun. Ecclesiastes 3, 12 and 13, same idea. God wants you to enjoy your labor, your work, your food, and your drink. And he says, I realize that this is actually a blessing from God. But Solomon's not done. Go to chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, 18 and 19. Here he'll say a similar thing. God has provided work and labor and toil. But then he even says in verse 19, wealthy individuals get their riches so that they might enjoy them from the hand of God. He says this is a blessing from the divine. And then the final time in the book of Ecclesiastes is in chapter 9 in verse 9. Go to chapter 9 and verse 9. Solomon says, man has no greater pleasure than to enjoy the wife of one's youth, their labor, and their toil, which is under the sun, because God's given it to them. Solomon, of all people, knew that pleasure in and of itself couldn't satisfy anybody. He tried that, but notice in every one of these instances, he not only says that God wants you to enjoy your life, but he always links it to the blessings that have ultimately come from God. What Solomon's driving at is part of humanity's purpose. God is most, glor most glorified in us when we're most satisfied in him, and God wants us to enjoy the lives that he's given us. He wants us to do that. It's not true. We sometimes say, you know what's the problem with the world? Everybody just wants to do whatever makes them happy. That's not by accident. People want to be happy not because they're sinners. It's because God's wired them for joy. They may be looking in the wrong place, but do you know why people are chasing pleasure? Because God's wired us to chase it. He's put it in our hearts. Now, we often go down the wrong avenue and down the wrong aisle to purchase it. But people want to be happy in life because God has made us in part for joy. And Solomon says, I surveyed everything. And here's something God wants. God wants you to enjoy. There's some researchers out of the University of Chicago. They said in their research in 2021, Americans say they are the most unhappiest that they've been in about 50 years. I was in a grocery store a few years ago, and on the check, in the checkout line, there was a Times Magazine issue. The whole issue was dedicated to this, and the title was The Science of Happiness. And in this magazine, there was one article by these researchers from Harvard. And you know, anytime you say Harvard, people think, well, they've got it figured out. They must be smart. And they did some research. And what they found out is, I don't know how they come to this conclusion, but they said adult Americans spend over half of their time, only half of their time, living in the present. We will live anywhere but the present. We'll live in the past, which we can never return to. We'll live in the future, which may never arrive. And so long as we do that, you and I will never truly know happiness. And Solomon says, God wants you to enjoy your life. One of the principles that he gains and that he gleans and gives out in this wisdom literature is enjoy the life that God has given you. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from above, James 1.17. And a part of why those blessings come down is so God can give us things richly to enjoy, 1 Timothy 6.17. 
We make the decision. God has blessed us in such a way, but it's up to us whether we are going to tap in and actually enjoy the lives that God has blessed us with. One of the principles that Solomon lays down for people is that God wants you to know joy. In your life, God wants you to enjoy it. Now, as I'm saying this, there are two types of people listening. Somebody's hearing this and they're thinking about their life and they're reflecting from a spirit of thankfulness and saying, you know what? I've got a lot to be thankful for. I'm healthy, got a roof over my head, food in my cupboards, gas to get here tonight. And then there are other people reassuring themselves that this does not apply to them and they have nothing of which to be thankful. You're one of those two people and you get to decide which one. Ephesians 5 and verse 20 says, in everything, giving thanks to God and the Father through Jesus Christ. Gratitude is what ultimately moves us. The blessing is in the present, learning to live where we are. It's extraordinary. You read those verses in Ecclesiastes. One of the things that stands out is Solomon doesn't say anything extravagant. He doesn't. He just talks about food and clothing and work and relationships. And he says, if you have those things, guess what? You can be happy because God's blessed you with those things. But if you overlook those, you'll never know true joy. James Clear said in his newsletter last week, you don't have to move one inch to go to hell. Just keep thinking about all the things you lack. And you never have to leave earth to get a taste of heaven. Just think about everything you have. And Solomon says, one of the things that God wants us to appreciate with life under the sun is that you and I can enjoy our lives. That doesn't mean life always goes our way, that we want everything that comes into our lives, but we don't have to be miserable. We can be people that know joy. Now, here's principle number three. Solomon says, I want you to find and keep true friends. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, go ahead and turn your Bible there. He says, two are better than one. They have a good reward for their labor. If one falls, one can lift up another. But woe to him who falls when he's alone. Two can keep each other warm, but not the man who's by himself. One may be able to withstand another, but a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Principle number three Solomon gives us of his eternal lessons is, in this life, God wants you and me to both find and keep true friends. True friends. Find them and keep them in our lives. You read through the creation account in Genesis chapter 1, and what you find is everything that God made is good. God says, let there be light. That's good. Skies and seas, good. Trees and plants, good. Sun, moon, stars, fish and fowl, land animals and even humans, everything. On the last day, God says in Genesis 131, everything that I made is very good. And then you go into chapter 2. And God drills down into what happened on day 6, and he talks about Adam. And then in Genesis 2.18, your eyes fall on these words. God said it's not good for man to be alone. That ought to surprise us because sin doesn't come into the world until Genesis chapter 3. But before there was sin, God saw something in the perfect paradise of the world. And he said, that is not good and we can't leave it like that. He says, man can't be by himself. I'll make a help meet for him. And we read that text and I want you to know that's not just about marriage. It's not good for anybody to be alone. Even if an individual is single, it means you and I were made for companionship. And Solomon says, find and keep true friends. One of Solomon's eternal principles is you and I need other people in our lives to help us live for God. The loner life is a lie. You might say, I'm an introvert. I'm just not a people person. You may not be as outgoing as others, but you need other people in your life. You do. You need friends. You need them to live. I know in our culture what we typically think are there are two loves that we absolutely have to have. And we put these as chief. We say, you've got to have romantic love. Can't live without it. And after that, or in addition to that, you've got to have this parental love between parent and child. But you see, Jesus comes and flips that. The Bible nowhere says you have to get married. God loves marriage. He talks about it a lot. Nobody has to be married. God loves children. doesn't say anybody has to have children. But listen to what Jesus did say. Greater love has no man than this, but that a man would lay down his life for his friends. You have to have friends. The Bible doesn't say you have to have mar- be married. Jesus doesn't put romantic love at the top of life's page. He says there's a love deeper than that. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus, the son of God, the perfect man that ever entered into the world, he had 12 friends and he needed his friends. Jesus shows this, that even imperfect friendship is better than isolation and loneliness. You know, Jesus could have said, Peter, you talk too much. Judas, you're a traitor. John, you're going to be sleepy when I need you to be awake, and the rest of you don't talk enough to contribute to this friendship. What I've got to do, I really don't need your help. I've got this on my own. No, Jesus had friends. He did. 
Even God the Father is said to be the friend of Abraham. 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 7, Isaiah 41 and verse 8. If the self-sustaining God has friends and wants friends, you and I are self-deceived to think that we can make it through life without them. And Solomon says, it's a bad idea to try to live life alone. It's a bad idea to try to go through this life by yourself and say to yourself, well, I really don't need friends. We kind of view it in our culture as a cherry on top. I mean, if I have friends, if I have people I can engage with, great. But when all else fails, self depends on self. And Solomon, in inspired biblical wisdom, says that is a recipe for ultimate disaster. Jesus says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you, John 15 and verse 14. You know, in the ancient world, nobody thought their spouse was their best friend. I know we say that today. Nobody in the ancient world thought that. It is the modern culture that has tried to lump all of humanity's needs into that one relationship. The husband and wife relationship is important. Nobody in the biblical world thought that a person in the marital relationship alone was supposed to get every relational, emotional, and psychological need fulfilled. No, because for that, they also had friends. Even the Song of Solomon, a book saturated with love, has the bride conversing with who? Not just her mate, but also her friends. Because we need them. Proverbs 27 and verse 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, one's countenance is sharpened by another. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 17 and verse 17. You know, we can say a lot about Job's three friends, but here's what we know. They were his what? Friends. And we say, you know, Job's friends were great friends when they came and they did what? When they were quiet for seven days and they went with Job. But what if they were better friends even after that? You know, there's a lot that Job was going through. And why doesn't Job just say to Zophar and Bildad, and why doesn't he say to Eliphaz, just get out of my house and leave? Because some company is sometimes better than no company. They were still his friends. We think they were his debate partners. Those are his boys. They're wrong about his circumstances. They're dead wrong. But Bildad is this guy. Zophar and Eliphaz really are his friends. And when it all is said and done and God shows up, he offers up sacrifices on their behalf. You know why? Because they were friends. We need friends. And we need to be good friends. We need to be those that encourage others. Hebrews 3 and verse 13 every single day. Hebrews 10 and verse 24 says, consider one another, stir each other up to love and good works. When you see a friend going astray spiritually, you and I bear responsibility to try to bring them back. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, brothers, if any of you is overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore that person in a spirit of gentleness. Consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. Solomon says, whatever you do, find and keep good friends. J.C. Rowell has described friendship this way. He says, the world is full of sorrow because it's full of sin. It's a dark place. It's a lonely place. It's a disappointing place. The brightest sunbeam in this world is a friend. Friendship halves our troubles and doubles our joys. You say, I'm having a hard time. A friend comes alongside you, you just split your trouble in half because they bear a load and you bear a load, but they double your joy. When you smile, when things are working out for you and your friend smiles as well, your joy's just been doubled. Do you know why that's the case? Because you and I, it's not good, it's not for a person to be alone. And Solomon says, we need friends. There was an American research company that did some research after the pandemic. They said we were in trouble before, but after the pandemic, Americans, especially men, are really in trouble in relation to friendship. They found in their research after 2020 and after 2021, 47% of men say they lost some of the close friends they have. I find more people, don't you hear more people saying things like, oh yeah, we used to be close, but you know, we got busy. Life, we, we grew apart, and the Bible's saying, no, you do whatever you can. You need those relationships. 49% of men that they surveyed said they've got three or fewer close friends. We're on the verge of being the first society in the history of the world to boast in the fact that we don't trust anybody and that we're suspicious of everybody because of prior letdowns. And do you hear the inspired wisdom? Do you see Jesus' example saying, you just can't live like that? I know you think you can make it on your own, but you and I, we need friends. Maybe Solomon wrote this because he heard about his dad and his best friend, Jonathan. Maybe before David died, David talked to him and he said, you know, there were some times, Solomon, I was literally on the run for my life. And the only thing that helped me, 1 Samuel 18, 1, 1 Samuel 20 and verse 17, is that I had a man named Jonathan, who was my dearly beloved friend. I loved him so much that when he died, I wrote a song in his honor. And it's in the Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 25. Maybe he heard about that friendship and he just knew two are better than one. They have a good reward for their labor. 
And if you want to get through this life, yes, Jesus is our ultimate and best friend. But we need other people alongside us and we need to be their friend as well. Here's the next one. We need to view the past properly. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 10, Solomon talks about the past. And in Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 10, he says, Do not ask and say, Why were the former days better than these? You do not inquire wisely concerning this. He says, Make sure that you view the past properly, that you get a good handle on how things used to be so that you can live best looking forward and looking ahead. Solomon says, I want you to appreciate the time in which you live. And again, we're sometimes willing to live in any era except the one that God's given us. I don't know what era you grew up in, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s. But I know this. There's at least two things that are true about whatever era you grew up in. Well, let's say there are three. Number one, everybody thinks their era was the best, right? We had the best music, the best food, the best places to go. Number two, there were problems in your era, too. Remember, there's nothing new under the sun. Every era has had its problems. And here's number three. Whatever era you're thinking about, it's not coming back. You can dress like you used to dress back then, but it's not coming back. You can wear your hair if you still have it, like they used to wear it back then. But those days aren't coming back. You can talk the way individuals used to talk back then. You can do all of those things. But what God's saying is this. I want you to be my person in the present generation that I have you in. For sure, and the Bible affirms, there are some generations worse than others. See the book of Judges. There are all generations are not created equally as far as sinfulness and righteousness. And yet, God's will is doable at any time and in any place. And Solomon says, don't spend all of your time looking backwards. The only way to live life for God is forward. If he, Philippians 2 and verse 12 Paul says that whether I'm absent or here, I want you to make sure that you work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. I want you to live in this present era for God. Make sure you view the past properly. You can't go back there. All you can do is live ahead. Christians don't sanctify any error. We're not trying to crystallize a certain moment in time. We're crystallizing a certain person in time and taking the life of Jesus and trying to replicate that life in every era, at every time, in every place, no matter what. We don't want the 50s or the 60s or the 80s. We want to confirm, confirm people and conform them to the image of Jesus Christ right here and right now. One of the things about living in the past is in our rearview mirror, life back there, is often further back than it actually appears. We might think things were better or that we were better, but sometimes we actually weren't. In Matthew 23, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees in verses 29 through 32. He says, you individuals say, if you had lived in the time of the prophets, you wouldn't have done these things, but look at how you're treating me. See, it was easy for the Pharisees to say, we would have been spiritual giants if we lived back then. It's easy for you and me to say, you know, if I lived in the time of Paul, or if I would have walked with Peter and John, but the best evaluator of what we would have done back then, we would have done pretty similar to exactly what we're doing right now. God doesn't want us to live in some former time. Solomon says, don't do that. You don't inquire wisely concerning that. Instead, focus your attention on living for today. Here's number five. Always do your best. Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 10, he says, whatever your hands find to do, you make sure that you do it with all your might because there is no work. There is no thought, nor knowledge, no wisdom in the grave where you're headed. Solomon says, I want you to do your work with all of your might because you're not going to get another chance to live the life you're living now when you get to the grave. You always do your best. Colossians 3 and verse 23, Paul says to the church at Colossae, you work heartily as to the Lord and not for men. You know that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance of your reward because you are actually serving the Lord Christ. You want to live a wise life under the sun? No matter what it is, make sure you always do your best. One of the books I'm reading right now is by Tim Keller and a lady named Catherine Allsdorf, and it's called Every Good Endeavor. And in the book, Keller's talking about how do you do your work as a Christian? Not as a preacher. He's saying your job, whatever it is, if you're a janitor, if you drive a school bus, if you're a garbage man, if you're, you're, whatever you are, he's saying, how do you do your work as a Christian? And most Christians, and maybe some preachers have communicated this, when you say, how do I do my daily job, a pharmacist, a school teacher, I need to be evangelized, and I need to be talking to people about Jesus. And you know, I think that's a great thing. Anytime you get the opportunity to talk to somebody about Jesus, be sure to take it. But the Bible actually says one of the ways, okay, let's just take a pilot. What if there's a pilot? How does he do his work as a Christian pilot? I mean, is he dropping tracks on the clouds to leave for the buddies on Delta when they come through? How do you fly a plane like a Christian pilot? You land. You do what God wants you to do. Somebody says, how do I do my work as a Christian? You do your best. 
You work like you're actually working for God, like he signs your paycheck. And when you do that, other people see it. And it might be a window into the gospel. It might be an opportunity to talk to somebody. But even if it's not, whatever your hands find to do, you do it with all your might. Because there's no work in the grave where you're headed. You throw yourself completely into it because you actually want to please the Lord. You might remember this scene from Karate Kid. This is the old Karate Kid with Daniel's son and Mr. Miyagi. You remember? Daniel's having some problems with some bullies. Mr. Miyagi agrees to train him in martial arts, but there's actually no training as far as Daniel's concerned that's taking place. Mr. Miyagi says, I want you to wash and wax my cars. I want you to sand the floor. I want you to do that. I want you, I've got a fence for you to paint. I want you to do some of that. And one day, Daniel's just had it, and he goes to Mr. Miyagi and says, hey, I came here to learn how to do martial arts. You're teaching me nothing. I quit. I don't want anything to do with this because everything you're teaching me is ultimately a waste of time. And at that point, Mr. Miyagi takes Daniel, and he says, I want you to do some of the things you've been doing. And he starts waxing the car. Mr. Miyagi throws a punch, and Daniel blocks it. He says, I want you to paint the fence. And he throws a kick up, and he's able to block it. And he says, see, what you thought wasn't work. What you thought was just timeless, useless drudgery. What would ultimately prepare him for the crane kick in the final round when he wins the battle against his adversary. You know there are some Christians that are going to really do their best when they get their real job after they graduate college. But for right now, this is just McDonald's, so who cares? There are some people, when they own their house, they're just renting right now. So they don't care how they keep this place and where they live because, hey, it's not my place. I'm just passing through. In this car that God's blessed me with, I don't really care about this one. In this job, I don't really, hey, I don't want to live in this city. I want to go to a bigger and better city. And when I get to where I really want to be, then I'm going to turn it on. But right now, I'm sort of operating at half speed. That never pleases God, and it'll never ultimately satisfy you because we were never designed to live life halfway. Whatever your hands find to do, you might want to end up somewhere else, and I pray you do if it's in alignment with God's will. But even still, we don't get to wish away any of our days. Whatever your hands find to do, you do it with all your might. The job you're working now, that's your job. And you work like God's the one signing your check. Wherever we live, we do our best to keep it up and do our ultimate good that we can because we reflect the good and glory of God. And Solomon says, whatever you do, you do it with all the vigor, all the energy you can because God's the one that's watching. And we ultimately want to be individuals that are pleasing to him. Here's the last one. Solomon says, know your purpose and know God's promise. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14, he says, after all has been said, hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments. For this is man's all or the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into the judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. In the end, the whole purpose for, for human existence is to fear God and keep his commandments. This is man's all. This is man's duty. Solomon summarizes everything. Love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength is the way Jesus would say it. And here Solomon says, this is what it's all about. You're supposed to love, live your life for God and keep his commandments. God made us for his glory, Isaiah 43 in verse 7. He wants us to live out our lives for him, fear him, and keep his commandments. And some people say, I don't like that. It sounds like I'm just God's servant. I'm just God's slave. I'm just supposed to fear God and keep his commandments. What about the things that I ultimately want to do? But when we actually live for the one who made us, there's a deep enjoyment that we find even for ourselves as we do the things that please him. Solomon says you were made to please God. And if you try to live your life full speed in another direction, it's not going to work out the way you want. God's made us in his image, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Among other things, that means we were made to rule and reign alongside God. And though our image has been marred because of the fall of sin, God still gives us a certain era of dominion and rule. And he says, I want you to fear me. Keep my commandments. This is your all. And remember God's promise. God's going to bring every work into the judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or bad. You live your life in view of this reality. Everything I've ever done. God's going to bring it into the judgment. God wants me to enjoy my life. He wants me to live for him. He wants me to follow his word. But God's going to bring everything into the judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be bad. And when we've done that, even this life under the sun, with all of his failings and hardships and difficulty, it can be a life worth living. You know, you could say about Solomon, and some people have said that he, this, he's the wisest fool to ever live. Solomon says a lot of amazing things in the book of Proverbs and in Ecclesiastes, a lot of things that Solomon really didn't apply to himself. But Solomon's wisdom is inspired. And what he says is there's nothing new under the sun. Everything in this life has a time and a purpose, and that's including you and including me. 
We need to find our place in God's world under the sun. This is where God's put us in this era at this time. And whatever our hands find to do, especially in serving God, we should do it with all of our might because a great day of judgment is coming, a great day of evaluation, and God wants us to show up on that day prepared to meet him because we've lived our lives as if serving him was our ultimate all in all. Maybe tonight somebody needs to begin their journey under the sun by submitting to Jesus, believing that he's the Christ, the son of the living God, submitting to his gospel, being immersed in water, rising to walk in newness of life. We'd be happy to assist you as you do that. If you need the prayers of the church, among other things, one of the ways the Bible describes us is we're your friends. If we can pray with you or pray for you about anything, we'd be happy to do that. Don't try to live life alone. Find and keep true and good friends. And if we can be a spiritual friend to you tonight, let us know how we can do it. As together we stand and as we sing.